During this period in the U.S., the CIA and the military were researching new interrogation techniques, concentrating on psychological methods. Experiments included the use of drugs, though the results were never as good as people had envisioned. The trouble with using drugs is that oftentimes your subject certainly will yield information, but it may be a half-truth, it may be hallucinated, it may not be totally on the mark because he's so disoriented. Drugs really don't work unless you're looking for a very specific kind of information, the name of a, a spy, the name of a, a colleague. But if you're getting, want somebody to discuss strategic intelligence, what the adversary is going to do next, or what, they, what the terrorist cell is going to do next, you're not going to get it. In the desperate battle to uncover information on the enemy, both the North and South Vietnamese forces used brutal methods. So did the Americans, for the most part, indirectly. Oftentimes the Americans would threaten, for instance, to turn a Viet Cong cadre over to our South Vietnamese allies and close our eyes and turn our backs, knowing that the communists would think, well, I'm going to be tortured. And in fact, that would happen. The Americans didn't need to do their torturing. They didn't need to use strong-arm tactics because we could rely on our allies to put the fear of God into our adversaries. The surprise attack by the North Vietnamese during the Tet Offensive exposed America's lack of detailed intelligence about the enemy. Subsequently, intense pressure was put upon interrogators to extract better, or at least more, information from prisoners. And there weren't enough trained interrogators available. Oftentimes, because we were using not experts to do the interrogations in the field, but uh, people seconded from the U.S. military, we would use the worst kind of tactics. They would be beaten up, they would be uh, tormented. Well, if you put somebody under that kind of pressure, what he's going to tell you is whatever will relieve the pain. And it's never strategic intelligence. It, it, it can often be terribly inaccurate. And as time went on, we began to discover that many of the reports that had been generated during that post-Tet period were inaccurate. Young interrogator in Vietnam, Frank Snepp realized that a focused psychological approach would probably work best. When he interrogated Nguyen Van Thai, America's most important prisoner, Snap skillfully used his knowledge of Vietnamese cultural beliefs to weaken the prisoner's resolve. Do you hear me? Who is your next of kin? What about your father? He was immediately placed in solitary confinement in a snow-white room. We over-refrigerated the room. We had too much air conditioning because we knew that the Vietnamese believed that when exposed to cold air, their veins would shrink up. Snep played on the fact that he was younger than Ban Thai. There is a great sense of hierarchy in the Vietnamese culture. Why was this kid, which I was in those days, put up against Nguyen Van Thai? Because we knew that he would feel entered to have such a junior character, me, dealing with him. And he would rage. He would, he would be contemptuous. He would, he, would fail, he would refuse to believe that I might be one step ahead of him. Then when I managed to be, his vanity would come into play and he would shout. He would, he would give out more than he meant to. Snap also exploited a secret he knew about the prisoner's past. I knew that he had betrayed his father on the way up the party ladder, and I used it with him. Tell me your father's name. You're too ashamed to tell me your father's name? You venerate old age, but if I, as the young interrogator, do not venerate old age, if I don't venerate the senior cattery, if I say, you know something, you betrayed your father. How could you do that culture? I don't know anything about your culture, but I do know that's wrong. And do it enough, do it enough, and he begins to break down. Information from other prisoners played a big part in the interrogation, pitting one comrade against another. 
I was interrogating at one point, when I had him under my lens, eight other communist cadre, many of them from the same territory, from the same political elements. And so I would go into one interrogation, pick up a little bit here, take it into his interrogation, play it back to him, lead him to believe that one of his colleagues, one of his comrades was giving away much more than he actually was. That was a, a major element in my approach to this guy. Snepp eventually broke Nguyen Van Thai, and the communist gave up accurate information about North Vietnamese operations in and around Saigon. The techniques, a mixture of sensory deprivation, psychological ploys, and playing one prisoner off against another, are now standard interrogation practices. On the 11th of September, a whole new battlefield was created, with a new kind of enemy. Interrogation was once again to become a major weapon in the war against terror. Post 9-11, we've discovered that interrogation is absolutely key. It's a key element in the intelligence gathering process. We have yet to develop really good penetration networks inside the terrorist cell. So when you nab a top-ranking terrorist, number two and number three in Al-Qaeda, you've got to immediately begin applying interrogation technique. This is the notorious Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Hundreds of Islamic fighters from the war in Afghanistan being interrogated here, held in small cells with little or no exercise, and subjected to the full array of interrogation techniques. Sensory deprivation is one of the favorites today. Putting somebody in a snow white room, turning on the lights, turning up the air conditioning, serving his meals at different times, insulting him, we're going back to techniques that were really perfected in the CIA during the, the, the Vietnam years, and that is uh, subtle dialogue, total knowledge of the adversary, and uh, poking holes in his vanity. Another technique is to undermine a prisoner's cultural beliefs. If you know that as an Islamic fundamentalist, he looks down on women, you bring in a woman, and you not only expose him to interrogation by a woman, but she knows to go for his manhood, to go for his, uh, his sense of self as it is embodied in his belief system. She said, oh, aren't you ridiculous? Aren't, aren't you ridiculous? Or she can sympathize and say, see, I'm not so bad after all. He's so busy trying to hold off the stereotype that he doesn't see, see the lioness coming at him. If we're dealing with a tough prisoner, we say, look, we'll, t we'll turn you over to the Israelis. We'll lose you to the Egyptians. And that's enough, in some cases, to turn the tables and to change an attitude. So what we're doing today, I think, is updating a lot of old techniques, but we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of bad cops to play into the scenario. As we have seen, in times of extreme political crisis, governments and armies of all political persuasion have been prepared to use brutal methods in their information. But is the information we get that way really worth the price? The uh, strong arm tactics can elicit a certain kind of information. It can get a subject to tell you where a troop is located, who his best friend is, but it cannot elicit the kind of continuing dialogue that will yield strategic intelligence, which is what, after all, you really need in a war zone. Faced with a new set of challenges in the 21st century, the debate continues about how far interrogators should be allowed to go, while the search continues for the most effective ways of getting people to talk who don't want to. I want to tell you something about a television series proposal I'm working on. It's based on my history as a Central Intelligence Agency operative and on my misadventures as a journalist. Cold open. Two gloved hands unspool a strand of piano wire. Smooth out the crimps. Attach wooden handles to each end. The woman's neck is porcelain pale with the graceful curve of a Modigliani model a shadow just beneath the jawline. 
Suddenly the wire whips across it, tightens, bites in. A crackling sound, like sinew and bone bursting. The severed head topples to the floor, the glass eyes of the mannequin splintering on impact. Frank and his daddy guys reading Little Red Riding Hood to his daughter's kindergarten class as other parents listen in. But he doesn't like the part where the wolf gobbles up old grandma, so he changes it. This time, Little Red shows up, whips out a sap, whops the wolf on the nose, out cold. Wild applause from all the kids. Paige's daughter shouts out, way to go, Dad, and maybe she cut off his ears, too. Worried looks from the other parents. They're not sure they're comfortable with Frank's R-rated persona and its glimmerings in his daughter. Throughout the war, 80% of North Vietnamese materiel bound for South Vietnam had not been coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail system as we thought. CIA and Special Forces officers look for any advantage. On, we wanted to find out what kind of beer they liked. By the way, Budweiser was the preferred beer, and we would often plant uh, sabotage Budweiser along the Ho Chi Minh Trail system because we knew they would stop, take a little sip, and if the bomb worked right, they'd be blown up. We also spent a lot of time trying to determine what kind of cigarettes uh, Ho Chi Minh liked, Salem cigarettes. We wanted to be able to open them and thus do him in. As in every war, letters home are scanned for intelligence. I spent a lot of time reading love letters, captured love letters. Uh, taken from the bodies of communist cadre, particularly letters that related to stops along the trail, bridges that were strategic or certainly tactical pieces of intelligence that we could plug into our picture to better target our bombing campaign. Eventually, even CIA operatives call it an assassination program. The CIA was claiming that our assassination counter-terror program, the Phoenix program, was killing a lot of high-ranking communist cadre. I looked at some statistics showing the, the numbers of communist cadre over the years, and they hadn't diminished. Somebody, but they weren't the right Vietnamese. It was also apparent to me, as time went on, that we were never going to see a change in the paranoid quality of the South Vietnamese leadership, in part because we didn't want to see the paranoia. If you create a government, you create a puppet government, you create a protege government. The last thing you want to do is to admit that it has weaknesses. We in the CIA never reported extensively on the corruption within the South Vietnamese government, the weakness of the South Vietnamese military, the lack of security in the countryside. So we didn't realize how fragile the situation was. We are, I think, committing those same errors. Sure, we've been spying on the Maliki government, just as we spied on Nguyen Van Thieu, but what we are not doing and, and find it very difficult to do in any context like this is to find fault with your protege. In Iraq, as in Vietnam, uh, how can you easily induce the population to coalesce and fight for their own uh, uh, interests if the Americans are always, always providing the security and always managing the infrastructure and, most importantly, the money? During the period of Vietnamization, the South Vietnamese had a good shot, but they were plagued by the very problems that are plaguing uh, Petraeus' uh, uh, Iraqis and the Iraqis during this period of Iraqization, if you could put it that way. And that is, you, you will never overcome the paranoia between the central, for the central government and the localities. Sure, uh, Anbar province looks pretty secure, but never forget, it was because American forces were right there backing them up, special forces. Okay, we'll do more of it in the future. Okay. The same was true in Vietnam during the period of Vietnamization. If the drawdown occurs 
and we discover this, that the Iraqi army is still rife with corruption, unconnected uh, to the leadership, uh, and certainly not uh, at all attentive to the sectarian divisions that divide the country, in fact, is a force for continued sectarian violence, you're not going to have an outcome that's any different from what we saw in the last days of the Vietnam War. I fear. I fear. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon. The CIA occupied the top three floors. These rooms once housed the largest CIA station in the world. It was the last building abandoned when Americans pulled out. Only a few of their Vietnamese helpers escaped with them. This room, which is so barren now, was the CIA primary radio room. And uh, a lot of CIA operatives carried little radios on their belt known as diamond net radios. That was sort of the code word for the system. And they left these radios strewn around Saigon. And Vietnamese who'd been left behind were grabbing up these radios and calling in. And I remember very vividly standing in this room with voices coming in over the radio circuits. Vietnamese calling for help, desperate for help. I'm Mr. Han, the translator. Come rescue me. I'm, I'm Miss E, uh, uh, your driver. Please don't forget me. I have my mother here. We'll be killed by the communists. In fact, it's a, a memory of the last day that has never left me. I have been plagued with nightmares. I call them sound mares of Vietnamese screaming over this radio for help and these walls literally seem to reverberate with their cries of panic. I saw it as the most Highness betrayal of our friends. The only thing you have to offer a source is loyalty and the assurance you will take care of them. And when you abandon a source, you'll never hire or recruit a new source. They'll never trust you. And so what we did in Vietnam those final days was to commit the one error that an intelligence officer must never make we let people who work for us see that in a crunch, we wouldn't do anything to help them. No one who has seen that incredible picture of the helicopter sitting on top of the deputy CIA station chief's house with a man leaning over helping Vietnamese up the ladder on the last day, that famous picture could uh, suppress emotion about Vietnam. On the last day of the war, when the Americans evacuated, we didn't even have a list in the embassy of the Vietnamese we should be pulling out. Come on, this way, hey! That sums up our sin of omission. We failed to plan in time or adequately for any kind of evacuation. And that resulted from wishful thinking, the hope that it really wasn't over, that everything could be turned around through a last minute political fix, all of which, strangely enough, was contrary to our best intelligence. If we believed our intelligence, the evacuation would have been planned at least weeks in advance. During the middle of the afternoon on the last day, Large helicopters began landing in this courtyard to evacuate uh, the Vietnamese and the Americans here, the last of us. And as they began to land, many bags of half-shredded classified documents, which had been set out along the edge of the parking lot here to be burned, broke open. And there were pieces of classified material, the most highly classified stuff we had in the embassy, clinging to the trees around the compound. Confetti, which the communists, when they came in, piece together to get a picture of some of the secrets we'd left behind. We turned over to the communists were allowed to be captured by the communists, a virtual blood list, which facilitated their targeting of people who had worked with us in Phoenix and other pacification programs. 